My check, my check. Motor Masters podcast, your main of course. I got a special guest across me. Uh, this is also uh, somebody who went to Payne College uh, from here. I uh, went to Hepsburg High School, right, as yes. well. Um, can you please tell, tell the audience uh, first y- y- your name and, and what you do before we get started? Okay, so my name is Tiana Bias. I'm a local attorney in Augusta. I'm actually from Augusta. Um, as you already said, I graduated from Hudson High School and I majored in sociology at Payne College where I attended on a full scholarship, thankfully. I moved to Savannah to attend law school and then I came back home to start my career. I used to be a prosecutor when I first got out of law school and mm. then I switched to criminal defense at the Hawk Law Group. And recently I opened my own branch, which is the Bias Firm. It's a local um, defense firm based on criminal defense. And I also do some family law as well. Well, before I get into the, just a little bit about your background, like, kind of explain it um, for people that aren't uh, criminal justice driven or, you know, kind of um, just they don't, they don't know about the, the system. So when you say the defense and, and prosecutor, tell the difference between the two. Yeah, so a lot of times I speak at schools and I always tell the kids the easiest way to remember what a prosecutor is is because their job is to, quote unquote, put people in jail. That's Mm. not really their job. Their job is just to hold people accountable for violating laws in the state of Georgia. So they are the ones who bring charges against someone who's accused of a crime. And their job is to prove that that person committed that crime beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, a defense attorney on the other end, our job is obviously to show why you did not do that crime. And in the event that you did do the crime that you're charged with, our job is to get you the best result possible so that you don't end up losing your rights, your liberty, your freedom for an extended amount of time that's not fair or appropriate to the conduct that you're accused of engaging in. Well, first of all, um, that was an amazing explanation. I want to say that. All right. That's number one. Let me clap it up for you real quick because that was was amazing. (laughs) I deserve a clap. Okay. Um, (laughs) But do you ever feel uh, judged by people when you say what lawyer you are? Because I've seen it in movies or in shows, and you see these uh, instances where when you are on the defense side, people are like, hmm, they kind like, of like side eye. Yes. But when you're on the prosecutor side, like, oh, yeah, 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 get him out of exactly. here. Exactly. You know? And so uh, occasionally you do, but usually that goes away when somebody needs your assistance, right? So <laughs> when I used to be a prosecutor, um, one of my last uh, trials at the district attorney's office, I was actually prosecuting someone who used to went to high school with me, um, and he was accused of murdering his best friend who uh, graduated from Cross Creek. And so that was a difficult trial, obviously, because his the parents of the victim knew my parents, mm. and so I have a courtroom full of people who either know me because they're related to the victim and know my family, or they know me because we went to high school together, and here I am trying to prove that they're friend committed a crime where they're facing a life sentence. And so um, when I was at the district attorney's office, I was the only minority attorney in felony um, prosecution because we had two other minority attorneys leave. And so the office is a lot more diverse now because of just changes in staff. But obviously there was judgment when I was a prosecutor because it looked like I was trying to send people to jail who looked like me, right? But um, thankfully, I had a reputation for being a very reasonable prosecutor. If there was anything I could do to um, get the defendant in a better position, I would obviously try to as long as the victim's needs were satisfied and making sure that justice was served because sometimes justice doesn't involve putting someone away for the maximum amount of time. Sometimes justice means that the defendant needs rehab or they need some other support services so that they don't come back into the court system again. And then as far as being a defense attorney, people always judge you um, when they hear you're a defense attorney, especially with me being a mom. It's like, oh, well, how could you acu- uh, you know, represent somebody who's accused of child molestation or rape? And I just explained to them that my job is to hold the state accountable, right? Mm-hmm. And so everybody wants the justice system to work in their favor. But when you're the person who's facing the time, you want to make sure that your rights are protected as well. And so that's what my job is, is to just make sure that the system functions appropriately. Sometimes the system of functions, um, you know, in a way where my client might be facing a life sentence and I might get them a resolution that involves them doing less than 10 years. And so I feel good about that because now I've kept a child from having to come to court and testify about the worst day of their life. But I've also gotten a great result for my clients so that they can either be rehabilitated or removed from society until they are safe to return back to society. Well, um, another great explanation, by the way. You do a great job at this, so I, I know you, you know you know what you're doing. But uh, yeah, so I, I wonder, like, even in in that instance, uh, getting someone like a, a sentence that maybe some may deem too light or mm-hmm. not not uh, you know you you mentioned 
uh, justice. And I think uh, a lot of times, and correct me if I'm wrong, people that are depending on what side of the fence you are on, whether you wanted to you on the defensive side or you on the prosecution side, as far as like the family and people that are related to the to the victims or the aggressor or you know people charged with the crime, I think that um they confuse punishment with justice. If yes. that makes sense, and those are two different. And exactly. they could be synonymous, but they're two different things. Exactly. Um, and it's very difficult to explain that to people until they get put in a position where they need to come sit down with the defense attorney. Um, and so the way I try to explain to people is that. Justice is what is best for everyone involved. And sometimes it looks like, oh, I'm keeping a child out of a courtroom, like I previously said. Right. Because I've had cases where in order to mitigate it, I have to explain to them like, hey, I understand that there's a child who you want justice for. But what will happen to that child if we take this case to trial and they have to testify about the worst day of their life? And then 12 adults come back with a not guilty verdict. Mm -hmm. And now that child has to undergo additional therapy on top of what they're already doing because they have to live with the fact that, hey, I was brave enough to bring this accusation to trial and 12 strangers did not believe me. And they chose to let this man walk free right. because there are risks that come with each side of a case. Um, and I think that people don't always realize that sometimes, you know, there are other punishments outside of just being in prison because one taxpayers are paying for that. Right. Yeah. So we have to consider what kind of, you know, strain that will put on society. And especially if it's someone with a drug problem. Right. Uh, the ultimate goal is to keep them from doing this to someone else in the future, even if it's not a violent crime. Maybe they need counseling. Maybe they have a mental health issue that has never been addressed before yeah. they actually came to court. And so we have to look at all of those different factors to see if there are wraparound services that need to be put in place um, or if there's an accountability court that they need to be in. Because people think of crimes and they think rape, murder, aggravated assault. They don't think about the DUIs that you yeah, know yeah, put yeah. people in danger and then our defense attorney's jobs are to make sure that our clients don't engage in that kind of risky behavior in the future. Um, and so usually most people don't realize that if you're fortunate, you're going to know someone who's never been charged with the crime or been the victim of the crime. But yep. if you're like regular ordinary people, you're either going to be unfortunately the victim of a crime, even if it's just someone breaking into your car, or you're going to be charged with the crime if you're, let's say, you know, you're driving down the street and you get pulled over and your friend has drugs in his pocket yep. and he doesn't make a statement to law enforcement and take ownership. The next thing you know, everyone in the car is being arrested. And those situations happen every single day. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I think uh, one of the things that you said earlier, too, just about the, the punishment and, and justice piece, I think uh, just depending on what, what side you're on, too, because you can also be on the on the prosecution side per se, and that person does get sentenced to let's say, just say life, could just say it's murder, yeah. right? Uh, once again, everybody goes straight to murder for some reason, but <laughs> <laughs> that's the only crime being done. But if it's murder, and some people they they even don't think life is enough. They want that person to die. They want yes. they want the death penalty. They, they want something so like so egregious that, like, but it that's not always justice. Sometimes exactly. it's just the fact that okay, well you're gonna think about this for the rest of your life now. You know? Exactly, and especially um so. Unfortunately, right now, Richmond County is one of the number one, if not the number one county in the state of Georgia for uh, juvenile offenders being sentenced to life without parole for violent offenses. Um, and if you've ever done any research on that, uh, there were recent laws that came about as to whether or not it's, you know, such an egregious punishment to sentence someone to life without parole for a crime that they committed when they were 16 or 17 before their brain was fully developed. Right. Now, uh, as an attorney, I'm still a human, right? So if I'm representing someone charged with murder, you know, it's not lost on me that the person who lost their life is someone's son, someone's brother, someone's friend. Someone out there loved that person and cared about their life, even if it was someone who was homeless, right? We see right. a lot of violent crimes against homeless people and there is someone out there who cares about that person, even if they're in this unfortunate circumstance. But nonetheless, we have to think about whether or not this is going to put someone in a worse position than when they first started. So let's say you represent someone who's 16 and they're the non-shooter in a crime. I had this incident happen last year um, and they choose to go to trial and, you know, exercise their right to bring their case before their jury. And if they're found guilty. Does that mean that they are someone who can never, ever be rehabilitated, which is what right. life without parole is? Right. To say someone should never be released from prison means that there is nothing you can do to make this person a functioning member of society again. And that's not always the case. And I tell everyone that I meet, you know, 
everyone's committed a crime, whether you got caught or not, even if it was just you rolled through a stop sign. I say the same thing every day. <laughs> you, you speed in, you committed a yes, crime. Like, and people, every day. anytime you get behind the wheel, you are going to commit yes. a traffic infraction, whether you're trying to or not, whether it's, you know, you put your phone on you or you pick up your phone to cut it off or whatever you're doing, you know, and no one wants to be judged by the worst day or the worst mistake that they ever made. And so there are some people where if you have, you know, habitually committed violent offenses, you've just ruined people's lives over and over. And then you may be someone who cannot be rehabilitated. You've done multiple sentences in prison. You've gone through rehab. You've gone through therapy. They've addressed every need they can think of for you. And you still are, you know, committing violent offenses where you're either, you know, violent towards women or sexually violent towards people, then maybe a life without parole sentence is appropriate. And that defense attorney's job is to explain to their client, you know, what their options are. But that's not always the case. Some people and people don't realize that when you send someone to life, that doesn't mean they're going to get out in 30 years. That doesn't mean as soon as they hit that 30 year yep. sentence on life, they're going to get out. They have to go in front of the parole board. It's called life with the possibility yeah. of parole. So it's not a guarantee. And then you have to think about if you look at yourself now, like, I mean, I'm not 46, but let's say I have a 16 year old who can't be released until they're 46. Look at yourself right now and think about how you were at 16. I'm vastly yeah. different than I was at 16 years old. I mean, I was very talkative and argumentative and all the things that I am now <laughs> at 16, but I was still a completely different person. And just the way that I viewed society and what I could be peer pressured into doing was very different at 16. So what happens if I get in the car with my friends and I think that we're just going out to have fun and someone goes into the gas station, and they pull out a gun and they rob a bank. And now I'm in the getaway car. My choices are to either hop out the car and try to call law enforcement or to just try to make it home to my parents and then tell them what happened and figure it out from there. But if you stay along for the ride and say, look, I'm 16. I just need to get home to mom. Something terrible just happened and I don't know what to do. Under the law, a prosecutor can argue that you're just as guilty yeah. as the person who committed the robbery because you didn't disengage from that situation. And so that's why I think it's so important to have, you know, young attorneys, minority attorneys, men, women, people from all different walks of life. So that when your client comes to you about a situation, you can understand that they're telling you the truth and that even if it's not a situation you've ever been in, you can understand the societal factors that go into someone being in that situation. Yeah, so you, you said um, some things just now that um, I, I've talked about with people. So I had the uh, the DA on um, earlier this year, too. And I know, like, I think people, some people that don't like him, uh, their thing with him is that he's too soft on crime. Uh, that's that's the narrative. Um, and but talking to him and by watching him explain his mindset behind the whys of some of his decision making, I kind of understood it because you do think about things like, well, Let's see who's attached to this person. You got kids yes. coming up. Because if I take this person away for life now, this 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 person, A, whoever that is, man, mom, dad, whatever, and you got a son or some a kid, a daughter, and I take that away from you now, you're likely to also recycle that and, and come exactly. back to the system. So now I'm cognizant of like when I'm judging this person or when I'm, you know, deciding what the sentence or whatever should be the, the punishment or justice for this person, I'm also thinking about what's next to come because I'm trying to stop it altogether. You know? Exactly. And I understood what he was saying. that. Now, some people won't because they just don't like him, whatever. But Yeah. And I, I will say that, you know, that's a huge misconception. Um, not just about Jared, our district attorney, or just district attorneys in general who have a different approach to mm -hmm. how they handle crimes, right? And so um, with Jared's approach, just in knowing him, obviously, we've known each other for several years. We've had cases against each other. What people don't realize is that part of being adversaries in the courtroom is that you're not always going to get what you want, right? Even if Jared and I talk outside of court, he's not going to always give me what I want on my cases. Sometimes I get a great result, and it's not because he knows me. It's because the facts of that case allow for it. And so Jared's approach is slightly different from what we've seen with prior prosecutors. I used to work for the prior prosecutor, and she was very serious about crimes and getting those cases resolved as well. She just had a different approach from Jared. Mm -hmm. And his approach is to try to keep people from coming into the system to begin with. Right. And I really, you know, respect that approach because what people don't realize is that juvenile court is one of the biggest pipelines into Superior Court in the felony world. So when you have a child who goes in front of a juvenile court judge for a crime, that sometimes will significantly increase the chances of them committing a felony as an adult 
depending on how you address that crime that they committed as a youthful offender, right? And so with Jared, that's why you see him going to the classrooms and you even defense attorneys like myself, I go speak at schools all the time. I try to go speak at churches and wherever because what you want is for someone to not need your services. I'm grateful for all of my clients who choose to allow me the honor and privilege to represent them. But what I would love is to get education and information to them in advance so that they can make smart decisions when they're faced with these hard, tough crimes or tough decisions so that they don't end up getting arrested. Um, and so sometimes people think that being smart on crime automatically means that you're soft on crime, and it's not. It's really that you're trying to be more efficient with the resources that you have. We already have a significant backlog, and that's not something that we can just go to trial and try our way out of. You can't try every single case, but what you can do is either prevent those cases from ever coming in front of your office to begin with, or just trying to do the best you can with the cases that you have and the resources you have available. But I think too, like what you said, like just even to being smart on crime, uh, even the words, like I know sometimes we say words and because they all kind of go together, we don't really take the time to like define each one, but like smart on crime, we think about being smart is also just the fact that, okay, well, Years to come, yeah. this decision right now will help crime years to come. But exactly. to reduce, and that's just being smart. Exactly. As opposed to, I mean, throw the book at this person, and then when this person get well, twelve years, when this person comes sixteen, throw a book at that person. Now I'm just keep throwing a book, and it's exactly. not reducing crime. You just exactly. having harsh punishment. And so that's what confuses people. That's a great point. Is that people think that you're going to make a decision and you're going to immediately see the effects of that decision, <laughs> yeah. right? And it doesn't work like that. Um, and especially when you're dealing with the criminal justice system, if someone has a crime where they're facing 20 years, of course that's not a case that they can make a final decision on in six months. But also with the prosecutors, they have victims on the other side of those cases who mm -hmm. obviously want to bring this case to a close, get their day in court. And they also have defendants. And so when people hear these crimes on TV, this is not just a news article that you see about a shooting or a robbery or a drug transaction or a fentanyl overdose. These are actual people with rights and privileges and family members and a number of different components go into those situations. And so sometimes being smart on crime means allowing this person to go to accountability court because maybe they engaged in this crime because they have a drug, drug problem right. and they don't have health insurance, so they can't pay for rehab. Maybe they have a mental health diagnosis that they're not really aware of or they're trying to self-treat it by smoking or drinking or doing something else to alleviate that anxiety and depression. So you put them in a mental health court where they can get you know, affiliated with the counselor and get treatment. And then now instead of wasting, I won't say wasting, but spending taxpayer money to put them in confinement for three years and they come out and deal with those same mental health issues, now this person has been on probation for three years. They become self-sufficient. They also know how to maintain and manage their mental illness. And they move forward and become productive members of society. Yeah, and uh, you make great points. And I think, like I said, it's all about perspective. But I think a lot of times people don't want to have a different perspective. Like, if they came a certain way or they um, only been around a certain amount of people that have just a sway vision of how the world is supposed to work, that's all they know. That's all they care about. They ain't yes. trying to nothing else. So anything we talk about is like, well, no, it's foreign to me. I don't want to learn it. Yeah. So, and especially until it becomes you, right? And so that's what I have to tell people. You. So, for example, people think that Richmond County is too lenient on crime. I'm from Richmond County, so I'm a little biased, right? But I just don't think that's true. And I have clients all the time who might live in a more conservative area, and they love it. It's safe. The crime rate is low. You know when they don't like it? When they have a 19-year-old kid who's charged with a crime, mm -hmm. and now they're dealing with a prosecutor who is tough on crime. Yeah. And so you love it when you're the victim of the case, but when you're the party to the case or it's your child who made a crazy or stupid or dumb or whatever, as if you want to give it decision, and now you're looking around like, my goodness, I've been living in this county for 30 years, and they're trying to throw the book at my son. But six months ago, you were watching the news and someone else's son got the book thrown at him and you yeah. were just fine with it and thought, you know, that was perfectly appropriate. They should have never done that. But and I know it's, it's going to sound odd when I say this at first, but that's why I think a lot of times I know they say, you know, art imitates life. And I think of our movies or even songs that are heartfelt, but a lot of movies that showcase that where you see a kid who this was a regular kid. And I saying they was innocent. I say they was just the greatest kid, but just an innocent kid uh, come up on a, a bad situation. And then they're getting this harsh punishment. I think sometimes watching that movie or seeing it, you're able to feel something, mm -hmm. right? Because you know that it could be you. When, you when, when, when art is depicted in a way where it's like, it could be anybody, I think that's when you see it the, the most or you feel it the most. But until then, like, you don't, if you don't have that feeling of it, you don't know. So like you said, until it becomes you. Yeah. And I, I prefer to watch a movie, if that's the case, right? <laughs> watch a movie because you don't want it to become you. But also, you don't want to be the person that where like, you changing your mindset on things because this is your 
you, you attach your nephew or this yeah. your, your son, your brother, your friend. So yeah, the, the part of till it becomes you is important. But I also think um, that helps sometimes with the, the mindset of how you look at uh, cases or uh, any situations going forward as well, because you do read these articles, right? And mm-hmm. at first you just judge because, well, I don't know how, how you feel about this, but like, I don't know how much uh, public uh, opinion uh, plays a factor in your, in your world and what mm-hmm. you do. Um, or like publications, like, you know, I'm not saying no publication name, but you know, yeah, you know the publications, I don't got to say them, but those publications that a lot of times, even from the, from the get go to start, you know, this person is, is murdered, right? Oh yeah. I mean, just keep using the, the toughest crime, right? And they murder. But then in the, even the picture they show, like, sometimes they, 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 they'll they show the you how picture. they want you to view this murder. Mm-hmm. Like, I hate to say, but it's almost like, hey, he deserved it. But this, exactly. is, you know, this is what happened. Yeah. And they do it all the time. And it's very unfortunate, especially when, let's say someone loses their life and they were known to be a mm-hmm. drug dealer, right? Does that mean that their life wasn't worth the same amount? And the answer is no. And so um, that makes it tough for the prosecutor, right? Because now when they're bringing the case, they have to make sure that the jury still views this case as important and they don't go into a jury trial saying, hey, you know, this guy took the risk by selling drugs and being around guns and all this other violence. So why should we care that this person lost their life? And the reason you care is because you don't want to encourage violence in your area. And uh, it's just very unfortunate when you see those kind of publications come up and they send out a terrible, you know, photo of the victim. And I, it's also just as bad to me when they do it for the defendant, mm-hmm. because you don't know what that person's story yeah. is. You don't know whether they engage in this behavior and self-defense or if there was some underlying factor that led to this happening and they actually will later be found not guilty of murder. But now you've made it 10 times harder for them because once we go to a jury trial, because most murders are going to resolve with the jury because it's very hard to convince someone to plead to life. Yeah, and yeah, at that yeah, point to them yeah. is I might as well risk it and go to trial. The worst that can happen is I get life without parole. And to me, if I'm 20 and you're saying, hey, you know, just do that 30 years and maybe one day you can come home to a 20 year old thinking about what they're going to be like at 50. Yeah. They're like, heck, I have to survive 30 years in prison. Right. It's, I might as well try it. But the idea of asking, not asking, but all just to bring it to a 20 year old to say, hey, take 30. If I'm 20 now. Yeah. I feel like, I'll, you know, at 20, you feel like you live a long life anyway. Exactly. Right? Like, you want me to do that plus 10 more years? Exactly. Here? No, I'm not doing that. Exactly. You know? And so it's going to lead to a trial. And so now when the attorneys go in front of the potential jurors, we have to ask them, you know, have you seen this in the news? Have you seen it on Facebook? What do you know about this case? Because we don't want jurors who have seen anything about the crime because it does influence them. Yeah. Um, and so that's just very difficult and it's very unfortunate when it happens that way, which obviously the media, you know, their job is to try to sensationalize stories so that they can get the viewers. But it's just, I think that, you know, there are some publications who do a very good job at being tactful. And I think there are some that just have, you know, some areas for improvement that we hope we'll see in the future. Yeah, you know, I, I, and for, for as far as what I do, like podcasts and so on, I see that a lot too. You see clickbait titles and things of that nature. Like, I've never been a fan of that. And I always feel like you just got to do it the right way. Yeah. Because that, in the long run, that, that's what's going to help you. But when you got a publication that do things like that, they do it for a reason. Yeah. Sometimes they won't They won't even change things until enough people complain because you're going to yeah. share it, you know what I'm saying, while you're complaining still. So it's yeah. like, let's just do this and let's, you know, we'll, we'll say sorry later. Exactly. Or if they even say sorry. Yeah. Uh, sometimes they just change the picture and call it a day. But I was going to ask you about that, not so much about the publication per se, but, you know, it, we, are, we are in a small town for the most part, a uh, tight-knit town, so these are going to be the p- people that's going to be on the jury anyway. Mm-hmm. So when you have uh online publication that's, uh, that uh, reports the, you keep a murder, first the <laughs> murder, right? Uh, and they have these pictures and they have a, a story. So they mm-hmm. have some kind of story they have already. Yeah. You know, some people are only going to see that story. Exactly. They're only going to see that picture. And then let's say, for instance, you take the case, right? Mm-hmm. You got this case. So in them comments already, people are already saying he, this person that they don't know. Yeah. They don't know the suspect. They don't know. They just know the person is 16. Yeah. They, they got all these ideas of what should happen. Exactly. Whether it's racial slurs, which is a lot of those, or it's just like, you know, throw this person away or this, mm-hmm. that, and third. So now you take the case on. They only know that publication piece. Exactly. They don't know all the ins and outs, all the details, all the new evidence, all the if the, the evidence that you have to throw away because that's not true. They don't. And then that, that publication doesn't really go back and say, hey, I know we reported this, but now it's this. They don't get to do that. Yeah. So I wonder sometimes like if that even is something that attached to you, you guys' name that, that, that try these cases. And people remember when that story came out, mm-hmm. but then the case came out. Maybe the person didn't get the idea they thought they should have got. Maybe they yeah. got off. You know, and it's like, well, they got off because the evidence wasn't sufficient or exactly. they got off because 
the evidence wasn't enough to convict them. Or they maybe they was innocent. Who knows, yeah. right? But does that ever backfire on you guys as far as like y'all name or how people view y'all when they see a, a publication and then you're successful with your trial, your yeah. case, and then moving forward from there? Yeah, so absolutely it can, especially because people don't know everything that happened with the case, right? So they'll just say, oh, I can't believe so-and-so would have represented this person or, you know, there might must have been some sort of backdoor deal or they have all these myths about what would happen, right? Even when I first uh, left prosecution to become a defense attorney, it was, oh, well, you know, are you going to try to work with the DA on my case and, you know, try to work against me? Because people have, you know, preconceived notions about what attorneys do. Obviously, we have reputation for being liars. And I think explain to my clients like you know I, I like all my clients but I don't like anybody enough to risk my law license right. and so I have to tell them that there are professional rules that govern attorneys and there are a lot of things that go on that you don't get to see there are a lot of things you see on television that we don't actually engage in right um, but I think that if you do it right then people will respect the outcome because they know that you you know checked all your boxes yeah. you went about it the right way to get a good result I've even had jurors um, who have served on jury trials where they didn't like my position but they respected my argument because they knew that I was advocating for my client and I didn't do it in a way that was disrespectful or distasteful to the victim. Uh, because you don't want to ever get into, you know, pointing fingers or blaming people. And sometimes that is your argument, but it's a way to do it tastefully because they have victims' families in there. You know, this case is important to them, too. And I mean, I've even had jurors where they didn't agree with anything I was saying in court. And then they later on called me a few months later when their family member gets charged with the crime. Mm. And usually to me, that's a huge compliment to say, you know, even if you didn't agree with me in this particular case, you respected how I presented and advocated for my client because you also want me to do the same for either you or someone you care about. And so I think that that's usually something that attorneys will hopefully be guided by one because it will come back full circle. Uh, your reputation is everything, right? And so word of mouth is going to be your biggest form of advertisement. And so even if you don't have a moral compass guiding you, I would hope if you're someone who's motivated by money, you would want to do things the right way so that you can continue to get clients in the future. Yeah, you said a good piece just then too, because I, I think about, I, I tell people, that's my daughter, I tell them, like, you know, just uh, be cognizant of what you're doing because you never know who's watching. Exactly. So even though people are watching you and, and disagreeing, yeah. they're still watching you, your body language, your demeanor, you know what I'm saying? Like, the attitude you have going into it, the passion exactly. you have. And I think even if they not agreeing then, it's like uh, it still it stays with them, you know? Exactly. And then they're like, you know what? I like the person's attitude. I like the person's passion. I like how yeah. this person approached this situation. Exactly. And then now you're getting to call it on. Just be, And you might have lost this case or wasn't successful mm-hmm. in this case, but it, even in the future, it, it still speaks more to your character. Exactly. And, even, and the same is true for judges, right? Because uh, the judge is not always going to give you what you want. But even whether it's a judge, you know, speaking to a defendant, speaking to an attorney, you know, the people in the courtroom are always going to watch and see what that judge's tone is like. And, you know, I always try to remind myself of this Maya Angelou quote is very popular that, you know, people will forget what you said. They'll forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you make them feel. Mm. And so that's always something that you want to take into any case, because even if my client doesn't remember every piece of advice I gave them, they may not remember every word that I said to them. They will remember whether or not I made them feel as though I was advocating for them, fighting for them, and whether or not that case was important to me. And then when we go to court, they will remember how that judge approached them. There are some judges where I've had them give my client a very hefty sentence, but it was the appropriate resolution, and we agreed to that resolution because it was much more lenient than what they were facing. And even still, they walked away from the sentencing complimenting the judge because they felt like, you know, They gave me an appropriate resolution. They respected me. They didn't insult me in front of, you know, my family who was present for the sentencing, the victim or the other people of the general public who are present. And so that's always something that you want to remind yourself is that this case is important to somebody. It doesn't matter if it's a misdemeanor shoplifting and they sold ten dollars worth of candy from Walmart. You know, that case is important to that person (laughs) who is charged with it. And so you don't ever want to make someone feel like, you know, this doesn't matter to you or them possibly losing their freedom isn't important to you. I think, too, one thing you said, and I think you don't hear a lot of uh, defense attorneys uh, say this is like earlier beginning. You you, you never said like, hey, um, you know, my success is getting you off. Yeah. You also said it's it's getting you the the reasonable uh, punishment. uh, justice exactly. um, that I can give you. And I think that's important because a lot of times people think, okay, I'm going to get the press, I'm going to get off. Yeah. And not getting off is like unsuccessful. Yeah. And that, that doesn't determine the success of the case, whether you get off or you don't get exactly. off. Exactly. 
it's the sentence saying it's about the things are done right in, 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 in the right form. Exactly. So. Which, obviously, for most cases, your ultimate goal is to get it dismissed. But you also want to be honest with your clients up front. If I have a client who has, you know, multiple prior felonies and they're facing 100 years and they've committed this crime over and over and over, then my job might be to say, hey, you know, you've previously gotten a slap on the wrist for this, but that was your first offense. Yeah. Now this is your 10th time being charged with that. And so I don't want you walking around saying, oh, okay, I'm going to get this case dismissed. Maybe an appropriate resolution for you might be probation. Maybe it might be a short stint in confinement so that you don't end up going to trial and getting convicted and, you know, getting sentenced to the max, which we don't want to happen. But you do see it happen where, um, you know, it's a thing called a trial tax. Right. And nobody should ever get a, a harsher punishment because they choose to exercise their right to a jury trial. Mm -hmm. But you do see where somebody goes to trial and they get maxed out as opposed to if they were to take a plea agreement and they could have gotten five years as opposed to 20 years. So as a defense attorney, my job is to make sure that my client, you know, I always tell my clients, I want you to hope for the best and prepare for the worst. You're not paying me to be your friend. So I would much rather a client say, you know, every time I talk to Tiana, she just was very harsh. She was very direct. But, man, I got a great result on my case. Right. I will feel much better about that than if they, you know, are sitting in their jail cell 20 years later. Like, man, I really wish I could be home with my family. But Miss Bias was so nice to me the whole time because that sucks. Right. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. want an attorney who's going to be honest with you. And sometimes justice isn't going to be your case getting dismissed, whether it's based on the facts, your criminal history the victim in their position. And so I've had clients where they're facing 80 years and they might get a 12 year sentence and they're going to at least be able to be eligible for parole in seven years. Right. And so if you're 30, you can say, well, you know, that's a great result for me because I would much rather come home at 37 and as opposed to going to trial and, you know, not coming home until I'm 70. Is it hard uh, uh, being as, as a defense attorney and, and trying to, because I, I, I've seen it a lot, especially coming up. Um, you mentioned Cross Creek earlier, and I remember it being a, a, a big case, uh, like maybe 2009, 2010, something like that. A young kid named Brandon got killed in, in South Pepper Ridge. Mm -hmm. And these two, got, two guys from uh, Cross Creek were, they said they, they did it. And I remember years later seeing in the paper, uh, well, one of them had passed away in, in jail, but I, I never knew like the, the sentence he got. And then the seat he got like 10 years, I guess mm -hmm. it was like manslaughter. And I think at the time I seen people saying, you know, in the comments, of course, they were just going crazy. And I wonder, like, wait, what's the process of when you have a uh, a story or yes, yeah, a story, a story, and you know it's, it's murder involved. We say murder because that's mm -hmm. the, that's the term we as, as regular people we use. Yeah, right. I know it means it's something different, and it got different components um, in in the criminal justice world. And we see a murder, but then somebody getting uh, ten years because it's manslaughter, mm -hmm. uh, maybe because uh, I guess a plea. I don't know. Like, what 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 are reasons why? Um, I guess the charge of change. Yeah. Okay. And so actually, um, at this, I remember that case very well. My grandmother lived right down the street from where it happened at um, at the time, and so people hear those headlines and they're like, oh my gosh, what happened? You know, why did yeah. it get reduced? It could be a number of things. One, it could be the age of the crime, right? And so it's been several years. They've lost one of their key witnesses. And so now the state might be in a position where instead of trying to bring the case to trial and getting nothing, they're going to try to modify that charge so that they can at least get some sort of justice for the family. Because just like there's a prosecutor trying to get a good result, there's a defense attorney. And so if I'm a defense attorney and I see that one of the key witnesses has died or the law enforcement officers have taken new positions and they're not going to come back and testify, I'm going to use that to advocate for my client getting a better result. Or it could be something different, not necessarily in that particular case where this client, you know, had a witness who confirmed that they were threatened or something else was going on to lead to that person losing their life. And now we have attorneys on both sides of the case saying, well, what is an appropriate result? Right. Because nobody wants to walk away with nothing, right? The prosecutor doesn't want to walk away with the not guilty and this man gets to go home to his family. The defense attorney doesn't want to walk away with the life sentence. So how do we meet in the middle when there are bad facts on both sides of the case? And so that's usually what will lead to that is that you have witness issues, you have evidentiary issues, um, or you have a victim who their family says, you know, we really don't want to go to court for this. There are some times where two friends might be committing a crime together and mm. one of the friends gets killed, right? And so that other friend now is going to be charged with murder because yeah. they were engaged in a felony and one of the people ended up losing their life. And sometimes you have a victim's family who says, look, they were best friends. They made this decision together. We don't want him to spend the rest of his life in prison. 
because of an issue that, you know, he actually wasn't the person who pulled the trigger, right. but someone else shot him. And so now this friend is being charged with murder. And so sometimes the victim's family will come in and say, look, we understand that something should be done about this because someone lost their life. This was very dangerous, but we don't want him to spend the rest of his life in prison because we know more facts about it than the public does. Yeah. So, and, and I think the friend thing is, is definitely an important piece because I think a lot of people don't even know, like people that get into crime or when you're young, you don't, you don't learn, a, you don't read a book of a crime yeah. when you start doing crime. You just, you don't get caught sometime and then you just continue to do it. I guess exactly. it just happens. And I, I've seen that so many times where you got two friends who they're going to rob somebody, whatever. It don't come mm. on their side. If one of the friends get killed, you know, and now the friend that was with the other friend, he gets charged with the murder because exactly. that person is self defense. But now we're gonna charge you with the murder. Yeah. Exactly. Maybe the family knew. We knew they maybe didn't live the best life, but they were best friends. So exactly. we don't want the, the worst to happen to this person. So I definitely I see that, and I, I didn't think about that that perspective until just now. So that was dope that you said that. Um, but even in, even in in the city, just in in this general in the general, like you have cases where, um, there's shooting cases or there there murder cases or whatever uh, cases of violent. But I don't like too sometimes the media they'll do. Is when, so I don't want to put this one out. Okay, so it it, it I know it could be a case where you know for a fact everybody's gonna be super sensitive to this case because mm-hmm. it might involve a kid, it involve whatever. And I don't like when they bring up the fact that sometimes defendants have prior mm-hmm. cases that either one they didn't get like a hard punishment, mm-hmm. or two they got off. Yeah, because they don't they don't never say why exactly. They just say the, some names and yeah. they say. Well, well, of course, when it's D, when it's Jared. Well, Jared, yeah. you know, had this case and this person is out, but they don't know that it was insufficient evidence. They don't know that it was just pretty much hard to really say this person did that. Exactly. He said, she said, we don't know. They don't know there's no camera footage. They don't know it's like maybe somebody else from the other side said this person didn't do it. They didn't. They're exactly. not cooperating as well. So there's so many factors. And then they'll say that as if like Augusta or lawyers or defense lawyers or the DA I like in some kind of like group just saying like, look, we're going to keep our people out exactly. regardless of what. I don't like that. I just I feel like yeah. that's, that's, that's corny to me. When it's just, to it's that. just a misconception. And a lot of people don't realize that, you know, legally speaking, you can bring up someone's prior conviction in court. And even if the case gets dismissed, of course, when the prosecutor is telling the judge what the criminal history is, they'll say, you know, he's been arrested 10 times, but he's only been convicted two or three times. And you may not know all the facts about it. Some of those you know, dismissals might have happened in other counties. Mm -hmm. But um, people just have, you're never going to please everyone, right? People are always going to find something to complain about. They're always going to have issues. And a lot of times when I I read the comments on, you know, different Facebook posts and articles and things like that, just so I can get an idea of, you know, what the public's opinion is on this issue. So if it is a case of mine later on, I know what kind of jurors to look for, what age groups to target, because I can see, oh, most of the people who are commenting this kind of, you know, inappropriate or incorrect information it belongs to an older group so maybe i don't want older people on this jury or maybe mm. it's younger people i don't want on the jury because of the way they're viewing this particular issue but i mean it's very hard to educate people on what's really going on in the criminal justice system unless they're going to go to these public events that attorneys are speaking at or if they're going to call and ask questions but usually people don't learn about how a case works until they're the one who's charged or they're the victim in the case yeah that's a good a good point you made too, because I guess it could be pros to some of that social media and um, or the, the 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 posting of certain cases because yeah. you get to kind of see okay in in advance who would you want yeah. who wouldn't you want like it helps you a lot like slice that that part in half when you got to go to the jury exactly. and all that stuff so that is dope um so just I want to ask you I know I was gonna ask it earlier but I'm gonna ask now like what even got you into wanting to be in criminal justice <laughs> at all so I I will say never say never because when I first went to law school, um, I knew I kind of wanted to go to law school. I would pray about it. I kept thinking like, oh, maybe I should be a lawyer. And I tell kids all the time, I used to just say I wanted to be a lawyer because when you're growing up and people say, hey, what do you want to be? If you tell them you're a doctor or a lawyer or that's what you want to be, then they stop asking you, right? They're like, oh, this kid's got a game plan. (laughs) And so it really was just me, I guess, kind of being manipulative growing up of saying like, oh, I want to be a lawyer because then they'll stop asking me what I want to do. And It ended up obviously manifesting into me becoming a lawyer because I was very argumentative. I asked a lot of questions um, 
and I like to read and just learn about things. But even when I first got to law school, I always said I would never do criminal defense. I have uh, a number of family members who've had terrible experiences with the criminal justice system, and it was just something that I thought I did not want to do at all. And then after my first year of law school, I loved criminal law. I had a professor who um, just really explained the subject very well. And I realized that there was a missing area in the law of people who look like me or have the same experiences as I do advocating for people to get the best result on those cases. And so that led to me uh, doing internships with a prosecutor's office, at a PD's office when I was in Savannah. And I just kind of stuck with it. And also just being passionate about the city of Augusta and just the needs of the people. And so I've considered at times, I've even taken a break. Um, I took a year off of taking criminal defense cases when I was with the group because I had so many cases mm. and I wanted to make sure that I was providing effective representation to my clients and you just can't represent everyone, right? I'm a human. I'm not a machine. But what I realized is that there were so many people who would call and trust me to, you know, advocate for them that it was just a call and I couldn't walk away from. And so, you know, I really didn't choose criminal defense. It chose me as corny <laughs> as it sounds, because there have been times where I'm like, I'm done with criminal defense. It's too stressful. It's tiring. I'm a very emotional person. And so every case that I get, I end up, you know, forming a good, healthy relationship with my clients because right. they know that I care about them. Um, but just wanting to change how people perceive the criminal justice system is really what drove me into doing criminal defense. That's great. I, I, I wanted that, too, because like I said, I know you said, you know, 16 or you would make maybe different. So even at yeah. 16, I wanted that you see yourself being like what you are now. Absolutely. Even not. as mature as you are now, you know. <laughs> Um, not gonna say too much, but like, even though like we're friends on social media and yeah. not even knowing, just kind of seeing. I, I remember like seeing your um, you had a billboard by Eleven Pepperidge. You got a billboard, yes. billboard over there with the uh, firm. Um, and then I remember uh, just I think trying to search somebody, and I've seen like uh, even you like typing. You know how you type back in the day? It was just so funny. It's like when you see them things, you see the growth oh, in a yeah, person. It you makes know me what I'm cringe. saying? I'm like, oh god! <laughs> you write somebody wall. It's just not deleted. Yes. It's still there. So. I did know that. I was like, okay, well, she she's she's from um an era I'm from as well. Yeah. Like when you type that way and stuff like that. So even seeing you today and like talking to you now, yeah. and hearing you talk on the phone and be so business oriented and knowing your stuff, it was like you see the maturity and how 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 life can change in this yeah. decade. You know exactly. And so then I think about like clients I've had where you know they get a harsh sentence, and I think about you know how differently my life would have been if I had gotten in a bad situation at 16. I would never be here today, right? Um, but I am thankful that, you know, I get to work in an area where I can be myself. Yeah. And a lot of times with my clients, I think that part of the reason they choose me is because I am myself. When I talk to them, I don't try to talk to them over their heads. I mean, the way I present myself in court isn't the same way that I present to a client that I'm visiting at the jail or if I'm visiting them at the hospital or going to their mom's house or wherever I have to meet them at, which I normally meet them at my office. But Sometimes there's an, you know, exigent circumstance or an emergency where I have to go somewhere else. And it's always so funny, even with like the billboards, like my nieces and nephew, they they thought it was so funny when they saw me on a billboard because I'm just a regular person. Right. My <laughs> yeah, sons yeah. didn't care about it at all. Like they're just, like, oh, look, mom, it's a bird. And I'm like, hey, that's my face right underneath that hawk. But whatever. Um, and so I do think that it's important for people to realize that attorneys are regular people. And so I'm glad that I have so many friends on social media. Um, but I'm also glad for the friends I've had since high school or right, college right. who comment ridiculous things on my post sometimes or share embarrassing pictures of me or like yeah. like one of my friends just shared a picture of me fresh in your couch. I'm like, oh, girl, delete that. <laughs> but I appreciate it because it lets people, you know, become more comfortable when they have right. to come talk to you that, you know, you don't have to look a certain way or dress a certain way to come speak to me or to ask me about your case. Or sometimes people will be embarrassed when they have to ask me a question. They think, oh, this was so simple. I should have known. It. I'm like, no, yeah. if that's not your field and that's not what you do, then, you know, you wouldn't know it. That's like me calling someone about helping to clean something and they talk to me about it like, oh, use this, this and this. You know, if that's not my area of expertise, then I'm not going to be embarrassed about trying to get information that I didn't know. Right. And I always encourage people, I would rather you be embarrassed and reach out and ask a question than for you to just make an assumption or Google it yeah. and think that Google is giving you the right answer instead of speaking <laughs> to an attorney and then putting yourself in a worse position. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's good, too, to also, like, stay grounded. Like, people that know a different version of you yeah. to always remind you, like, hey, remember remember you was like this now? Exactly. <laughs> so I, I like that. But then also it helps you with your clients, and you can say a, a version of yourself or a version yeah. of your 16-year-old friend who also is now successful. Like, dang, exactly. you know, I got to get this part of your life right so that you can probably be like this person. Exactly. You know? So I think even seeing that, like, seeing that growth in life also can help when you got these young 
kids coming in for these, uh, you know, these adult kind of crimes. Exactly. You know? Um, and then society. Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Like, on, just on laws in general, like, because it's so much, di- it's so different now than when we were younger. Um, I feel like we, I feel like we sound like older people when we say that. Yeah, though, I know. we sound like them <laughs> when they was when we was younger. But you know, a lot of it's a lot of kids now. Yeah, teens like 16, 15, 14 even. Um, I remember the, it was a case of they was this guy in, in uh, like I said, it says his birthday. He killed a guy on his birthday. He was only fourteen. Yeah. It was like, dang, but you know, it's like it's it's those age groups. So I wonder if they are or they should ever like try to change law because if it's to the point where things have gotten out of hand to where you know these young kids are going to be doing these kind of things, I don't, I still don't know if because like I said, their decision making is still different. They're not adults. Yeah. They are still just fourteen. I mean, somebody stealing your Kit Kat might change how you how you react. Maybe yeah. back in the day, you might have fought for them exactly. Out. Now they might shoot you. I don't know. You know what yeah. I'm saying? I don't know if, if they should really be <laughs> tried as an adult for that. You know, it's you got yeah. different cases, but I do feel like, you know. Yeah. And the law has changed a lot. Like, for example, if you've ever seen like the movie Jub- Double Jeopardy, right? Yeah. And yeah. you watch that in 2024, you're like, how the heck did she kill somebody? And, and then she got out of prison, you know, in a couple of years. But that used to be how the law worked. Not, you know, recently, but 30, 40, 50 years ago, sometimes someone might get sentenced to, you know, voluntary manslaughter or involuntary manslaughter, and they would only do about, you know, four or five, six, seven years, yep. and they would come back out into society. But the laws reflect the people of the state and what they want to see happen, right? Because we're voting for the people who write the laws that we have to be, um, you know, guided by. And it's just like um, when before we uh, started the podcast, I was talking about, you know, the title of your podcast and why I love it. Because what people don't realize is that we literally are living in the same city. And sometimes we live in two different worlds. And so it's easy to say, oh, my goodness, I would have never done that at 14. And you don't understand why these young kids don't value life. But if I'm a 14 or 15 year old kid who grew up in a neighborhood where, you know, an OG or somebody who's the oldest person I know is 25. To me, I'm halfway through my life. Yep. And so when you you have family members, you have grandparents, you have your parents who are still alive in their 60s or 70s or 80s, then to you, you can be in your 20s and 30s and think, I have the rest of my life ahead of me. Whereas if you're 14 or 15 and you don't have your dad in your life, everyone around you has died before the time they even got to 16. To you, you're just like, you know, I'm an adult now, so I get yeah. to make adult decisions. And it's also a lot easier for someone to influence you to engage in terrible behavior because it's someone you respect. And you might be respecting the wrong person or being influenced by the wrong person because they, too, had a terrible upbringing and they didn't have the resources that they need. And it's just unfortunate because some of those kids, you know, they come from very good homes. They come from a parent who cares about them and teaches them right from wrong. But maybe they're raised by a single mom who has to work three jobs in order to provide. And so she can't be home as much. And so, you know, it's frustrating when I see the comments on Facebook of like, well, you know, why was this kid out late at night or where were the parents? And, you know, there, sometimes it is a parent who could have been more hands on. But sometimes it's a mom back in the background somewhere who's just doing the best she can to provide for her kids because no one else is going to do it for her. And she doesn't have the assistance that she needs. And so I think it's important to look at all the other factors that could go into it before yeah. we just pass judgment and say, oh, this would never be me or this. I wouldn't have ever done something like this at 14. You don't know what led to that situation. I think you get all different perspective in them comment sections as well. It's so important that that comment section, for one, I'm not going to lie, it is entertaining. I'm not going to say yeah. that. <laughs> but I'll sit there and watch it before I read a book sometimes. I'll read all them comments. But exactly. You get to see different people's perspective. Do I get upset? I mean, sometimes it's like it's some, you know, idiotic comments. So I feel like, it's like you shouldn't have said that. But it, it kind of speaks to their perception and maybe what they've been through in life. So you can exactly. know a person, okay, well, they don't know this side of life or they don't understand this culture, exactly. Or even even it was us and it's, it's, it's minorities and it's a um a Caucasian uh, a person who has done something wrong and like I even see like okay well they don't understand that sometimes it's different dynamics in those kind of yeah. households. They got a mom and dad, but both of them not there. One of them exactly. working, one of them out running errands, you know. So it's, it's, it's seeing all different perspective in that comment session. You get to see it and you realize how different or how much of a melting pot it is in Augusta because yeah. you got so many different walks of life. And perception yeah, and so people. many different income ranges. There, so many. A lot of times, you know, everybody likes to focus on race, right? Because that's just the most obvious difference that you can see. But people don't think about the educational differences. If you're coming mm-hmm. from a household where, you know, 
you had to start working at 15 so that you can help your mom out and it made it harder for you to graduate from high school. Um, and so that's why even when I have clients who get a GED, I'm very impressed because that's not an easy task to, you know, drop out of school and then go back later and pursue your education. That's not easy for yeah. most people, especially a GED is very difficult to obtain. And so people don't think about those things about, you know, how your income could impact you and your upbringing and what kind of things you're exposed to, what kind of violence you're exposed to based on the areas that you live in, not having transportation um, and what that can do to you and your limitation on resources. You might be living in a food desert. Where, you know, yeah. at one point your mom was able to go to the Kroger. I used to go there when I went to Payne. And now the closest grocery store requires a car that she doesn't have. And so now her budget is a lot tighter because she's trying to buy groceries out of CVS. Mm. And so we don't think about all those different factors. But, um, you know, everyone's entitled to their opinion. I read the comments, too, and I find it entertaining. I just like to see how people, you know, advocate yeah. for or against a particular position. And I respect them nonetheless, even if I don't agree with it. But, I mean, Augusta is just a very unique city as part of the reason I wanted to come back here. You know, Augusta is a city where you either love it or you hate it. A lot of people say, oh, I'm never coming back to Augusta. I'm moving <laughs> to Atlanta. Or, you know, I like Atlanta to visit, but I would probably not live yeah, there. Um, and I just think that that's a beautiful thing about Augusta is we have so many people from so many areas, especially with us having the military community, mm -hmm. the medical community. We're bringing so many different people from across the you know country to this one particular area. I think... Uh that's, that's, that's an interesting perspective because I say the same thing. I say, you know, there's so many people from different walks of life mm -hmm. that move here because for a while it was one of the best retirement cities yeah. um, in, in, in the world, well, in, in the United States. But also, like you said, you got people who move from up north, from, from the West Coast, from all these different places from via military or just yeah. via wanting to retire and or their grandma's from here, whatever the case may be. So you got that. And then you got people that's from here all their life. So you got that perspective, which is people say they hate it sometimes. They, they live there all their life. They're like, I don't like it. But yeah. Me being, I'm from New York, and like me being from there, like you, you kind of, you very prideful of where you're from. Exactly. And so I say I like it. What you like about it? I'm like, what's not to like about? It? I love exactly. It. It's, just, it's a good city. Like why you don't? But they've been here all their life, and they've been conditioned to yeah. think that way about the city as well. Yeah. So um, it's just you see different walks of life of that. But I did want to say when you said food desert, that's the second time I've been brought up on podcast because I was my brought up a week ago, a month ago, or something like that, and I didn't get it until you just said it now. It could be a food desert even in. A city environment because mm -hmm. they, them taking that Kroger from downtown. Yeah. Now you're going to CVS, but CVS, them deals ain't the same. Exactly. It's so more expensive. Two it's two, more limited. It's two for six. Yeah. So now you're spending $4 extra on one item. Exactly. So imagine buying 10 items. Exactly. So that's 40 extra dollars you're spending. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, and it's a, it's, a, it's a trickle effect. So I think that's a, as a and that was a, a important piece to bring up. I do want to ask you about just cases in general. Like, so... Like in, in in the courtroom, I know you mentioned you know you got some judges that's that's going to be a one way, you're not gonna get what you want to get. Um, what is it ever a time where sometimes it does feel personal, or is it not 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 saying just with you per se, yes. but just you you know being in the courtroom and seeing it, does it ever feel personal? Or is it is it is it all like well we gonna do this because it's right? Exactly. And then if it's like that, do you address it? Do you address it? Do you just like yeah. okay next time I shout it next time or. Yeah, so I will say um, that is one of the great things for me about working with guys, right? So at the Hawk Law Group, all the other attorneys are men. And so they're a lot less emotional than I am as a woman. I mean, some women aren't very emotional. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not as emotional as some females that I know. But um, that was something I had to work at not taking everything personally because I can get very contentious in my cases. I can get very argumentative. Um, and I'm grateful for all the judges who bear with me because sometimes I am just like, you know, I don't necessarily want to get the last word in, but I want to make sure the record is straight as to what happened with my client. And so if a prosecutor makes a statement that I don't agree with, I will add one more, you know, word in like, well, let's make sure we clear it up now. But <laughs> another the same, thing. <laughs> exactly. And that's that's definitely me. Um, but it is hard not to take it personally sometimes where you think, you know, this is what a fair sentence is for my client. But you have to go into it with the understanding that the judge makes the final decision. Um, and you just hope that it's something you can respect. And if it's something that you don't agree with, then you help your uh, client pursue their appellate rights. But uh, we do take it very personally sometimes. I mean, the attorneys, we do talk amongst ourselves about, you know, how judges handle certain types of cases and whether or not they're, you know, treating people fairly across the board. And typically, I, the good thing about Augusta, and I mean, I'm the Augusta bar president, so I guess I'm a little biased too, is that we have a great bar. Our bar is very close knit because it is a smaller bar. bar what? Like the bar, the member, the okay, group okay, for okay, the gotcha. attorney. So um, the good thing about that is that we see each other, right? We see each other at monthly luncheons. We see each other at meetings. We see each other out and about at different legal events. So um, I do think the judges probably do a better job 
job than in other circuits of being respectful because they know us on a personal mm-hmm. level. Even if, you know, they're not coming over our houses on the weekends or, you know, our kids may not know each other, but they know you as an individual. And so it's like, you know, I don't want to be too rude to Tiana because next week I'm going to be sitting next to her at yeah. the luncheon. Um, and so that is helpful, but to, we, we do take it personally a lot of times, especially our more serious cases where, you know, I've had this case for five years and now it's going to come down to a four day jury trial. And so even a jury may look at me like, gosh, this girl is like very passionate about this case. And it's t- to me, you know, you get four days of this. I've had this for the last five years. Mm. And so I have a different connection to this client. Uh, you know, you're hearing about them, you know, taking someone's life or doing something heinous or selling a bunch of drugs or whatever. But I've got to meet with this client and I see them say, yes, ma'am. And no, ma'am. And call me Miss Bias. Even when I tell them they can just call me Tiana and I see how respectful they are or how intelligent they are, what potential they have. So, yes, sometimes when I get a resolution in that case that I'm not happy about, I will take it personally yeah. and get upset about it. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't think about that. The fact that, you know, you you start to uh, see a different version of your client um, or more of that person, yeah. not a different version, but more of that person. So now you know there's more to it than just this particular decision that was made exactly. or this situation he or she was in. Yeah. Um, so, and then if you got that case for that amount of time, that's five years versus y'all getting what I know in five years and four days. Yeah. But I got to give you the more important stuff. I can't tell you they got manners because that might not be important. Exactly. Hopefully you just assume, you know they got it because we, when they hit the stand or talk or whatever. So, yeah, that makes sense. I'm going to ask. So, I, I I do watch a lot of, like, criminal justice stuff. Mm-hmm. Lately, I've been watching, like, the YSL case. And, like, just every day. I'm, like, every single day I'm watching it. Like, uh-huh. every day. I still don't know what's going on, per se. But because there's so much different pieces to that. Um, or One, have you watched any of it? At all? Because I know you got your own stuff you, you, yeah. you're doing. So I do watch snippets of it. I actually know a few of the attorneys who are um, defending some of the individuals in that case. Um, and I do watch some legal shows. A lot of times you'll find that attorneys don't really watch a lot of legal TV because it's just not accurate. And so it gets frustrating. It would be like you watching a show about a podcast and yeah. they go record it and put it together and 10 minutes later it's published. You'd be like, it <laughs> takes true. me three days to edit this out. And so sometimes I'll watch something. And that's what I like about the YSL trial is that people are getting to see it in real time, right? Yeah. And so it doesn't normally take that long because there's not as many defendants typically. But I do appreciate that people get to see, oh, okay, you have to ask questions. And then someone mm-hmm. else gets to ask questions. And there are certain questions that you don't get to go into because people will watch a trial or watch like Law & Order SVU, which I used to love. And they're just like, oh, well, I went to this trial and you guys knew all the evidence that was going to come out. That wasn't exciting. I'm like, yeah, because it doesn't work like that. There's not going to be some mystery exhibit that I'm going to surprise the other side with. I'm required to turn that stuff over um, within a certain amount of time. And so that's usually the frustrating part about like seeing legal TV is that it's just not accurate accurate, or the timeline is is significantly sped up. But you have to realize they're trying to showcase what might be a five year case in 30 minutes or an hour, including commercial breaks. So, of course, it's going to happen a lot more rapidly. But now the YSL trial, I think, has been hilarious. So, yeah. And I, I, I wonder, like, this. I know the, the main character that which is, it was Young Thug at one point. But now Woody but has now taken Woody. over. And he is super funny <laughs> to me. Like, I, had, I, had heard, I knew of him before then because I watched a lot of um, interviews and stuff. But have you ever had or seen in, in, in real time, like, a witness that, one, entertaining on purpose, by the way, and then, two, like, just... Obviously, they already done said what they said, but in court, they want to stand on. They just they don't know nothing now. Like I don't know what yes. you're talking about. Like, how, how have you ever seen that? And then how does that shape a, tr- a case? So, I mean, I've had it on both sides of cases. I've when I was a prosecutor, I would have witnesses who, you know, this was a victim in a case, and now they don't want to cooperate because they live down the street from the person who's facing this serious sentence. Mm. And so now they don't want to testify because I have to go back to this neighborhood. And if this person gets acquitted, everybody's looking at me like, you know, you tried to snitch on him and he got off. Um, And so usually you just try to explain to the jury, like, look, you heard his testimony and the jury's job is to choose whether or not you believe him, whether or not you believe that, you know, when Woody says, I didn't know anything about this or X, Y, and Z, that he really didn't know anything about it. Or is he just saying that now that he's in court in because he knows that there's some repercussions that can come with it, um, which I mean, I haven't watched all the episodes or just keep kept up with everything about the YSL trial. But yeah. I'm curious to see what the result is going to be, whether or not the jury is going to look at it as though, you know, Maybe he did make those statements to law enforcement at first because he was trying to save himself or maybe when he's made those statements, he was telling the truth. And now he's, you know, retracting it because he's afraid of what will happen to him. And so that usually just comes down to what kind of people you have on your jury. 
I only ask because I wonder, like, if, and you don't have to next to quote unquote predict on that, but if, like, because so, just not even him, but so many different aspects of the case. I watch a lot of narratives about mm-hmm. it too, which is you probably shouldn't because they're not really in the room, but I take people's opinion because they, they watch it closer yeah. than I am. But you see all the narratives and stuff, and it's like, it seems like there's so much, so many, so much drama on each side, whether mm-hmm. it's the judge and, I don't know what this says. They keep saying a recusal or something. I don't, yeah. I don't know what that is, what that means. And so a recusal just means that you're saying that this judge is not a good fit for the case. Either they've already formed an opinion about something that they should not have, or they've done something improper, or they have a relationship with someone that prevents them from being able to sit on that case um, and be fair and impartial. Um, but I'm curious to see what will happen, especially with Brian Steele, one of the lead attorneys, you know, uh, being held in contempt. And, you know, that's a very serious situation to hold an attorney in contempt. Usually that happens if you're disrespectful to the court, um, like you're over talking another attorney Mm -hmm. or you're interrupting the judge or you're continuously, you know, disrespecting the court's time by either taking too long or showing up late. But, you know, in Brian's case, it was that he didn't want to disclose information that, he wasn't necessarily required to because I'm bringing information to you about you engaging in improper behavior. (laughs) And instead of addressing it, you want to know where I got the information from. And so I think he did what a lot of uh, other defense attorneys would do, which is, no, I'm not going to tell you where I got it from. Just address whether or not it happened. And if it did, then that's something that's what needs to be addressed, not where I got the source from. I'm just curious to see what's going to happen with it. Um, I think that it has been a very contentious case because of, you know, the length of time. I know some of the defense attorneys on it who have put a lot of effort into it. um, And they've been dealing with this case for years leading up until this moment in court. The the, the Brian Steele thing, because you touched on it, like when I saw it, that I have it's not too many things that shocked me. Yeah. But that shocked me a lot because I was like, hold on, this is really a, 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 a lawyer. Yeah. Really going to jail. Yeah. For being a lawyer. Yeah, we've had local attorneys get held in contempt. People don't necessarily know about it. It doesn't I, always I make the news. I gotta start filming it. <laughs> and said, yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? Never mind. What, what are you, no. Well, there's rules that go into recording what happens in court. Okay, but okay. we've had, I mean, not recently, um, thankfully, that I can think of. But we've had times where um, even Vic, uh, one of the founding partners at the Hawk Law Group, where we talk about stories about how different it was back in the day, where attorneys would frequently get held in contempt, whether or not it was that, you know, the judge was just more aggressive or particular than some of the judges we have mm-hmm. now. Not that we don't have aggressive judges, but the good thing is that when you have judges who previously were prosecutors or defense attorneys or were in private practice, um, you see them handle you with a lot more respect a lot of times yeah. because they understand that you have a job that you were paid to do or selected to do and that you're not trying to disrespect the court, but you are trying to advocate for a position that is your job to advocate for. Um, and then, like I said, in our case, in Augusta, it happens a lot less, thankfully, because the judges know each other and they know the attorneys. And so they understand when you're bringing some sort of information to them that there's more to that story that they're going to find out about later. Well, I, I, I wanted to touch on the, the, the recusal of the word, mm-hmm. right? So when, let's just say, for instance, is that if that's up and in, that's out there. Yes. Um, how does that affect the case going forward? Because now if you've been, the, been over this case over a year, some change now, yeah. and they, they you have this happen, and I guess the result is to take you off or whatever. Yeah. Well, not take you off, but like what did the... Well, the jury is seeing this, right? Yeah. And so it also depends on when the conflict arose, right? So I've had cases where I might have to file a motion to recuse before the case ever gets in front of that judge because um, the judge might... It's a might, real thing. Yeah, it's a real... Lot. I mean, oh, I've wow. had to file motions to recuse. And a lot of times, um, judges will recuse themselves. Like, a case will come up and they'll recognize the name and say, hey, you know, I represent this client back when I was an attorney or this person goes to church with me mm. and I'm hearing commentary from, you know, the clergy about it. So I need to take myself off of it because I might not be able to be impartial. And it's not that the judge isn't going to be able to do their job, but the law says that if there's even an appearance of impropriety, which is just if it looks like you might be biased, then you need to come off the case. Um, And so I've had motions. Usually you do it as soon as you find out about the conflict and say, hey, you know, this client made me aware of this issue because you all know each other or you know this or you know that. And so we're asking that it be reassigned to another judge. But sometimes that conflict might arise later on. Like, let's say you've had this case in front of a judge for a year and a half, and now somebody calls the judge and they start talking to them about the case and the judge tries to stop them, but it's their best friend. And they say, hey, you're presiding over Don Doe's case. I just want you to know that's my nephew, blah, blah. And so now the judge brings it to the attorney's attention to say, hey, 
you know, I'm just letting you know about this conversation that happened and I stopped it at the appropriate time. But what do you want to do about it? Do you want to request that I recuse myself or do you think that this is not big enough of a conflict for me to be able to stay on the case? And so it does sometimes taint the jury where they're going to look at it because the juries don't always understand that, oh, this conflict might not have, you know, arisen until he had this meeting off the record with this witness, or is it something that he always was biased from the very beginning? And now you have a jury who's thinking, well, if he did it this one time, what if he did it in the past and we just mm -hmm. didn't know about it? And so now the jury is going to be keeping that in the back of their mind. You know, they're going to get instructed of what they can and can't consider. But if you ever served on jury duty or talk to someone who serves on a jury duty, these are regular people who have their own thought patterns and how they're going to view a situation. Um, and so sometimes they can't overcome what they saw in court and think about whether or not this judge was biased or, well, you know, every time Brian made this argument, the judge was ruling against him and yeah. ruling in favor of the state. Was it because he didn't like Brian or was it because the right, prosecutor right. was making a good argument? And that's something that they're going to think about, which is why I always encourage people. Everybody complains about jury duty. If you get selected for jury duty, please don't try to get out of it. If you're somebody who is complaining about what you see in cases, you might be somebody who needs to be on a jury. Um, and that's because your regular life experiences can help get the best result in a case later on. Um, and so I always try to tell people, serve on jury duty. Like, don't try to weasel out of it or make excuses about why yeah. you can't serve. One, because half the time you're not going to get selected. They can only select 12 to 14 people, depending on the type of case it is, out of like 50 people. So yeah, you're probably not yeah. going to get selected anyway. But just hearing the process and how people view things differently after they've served on the jury, you would be surprised of how much of a better understanding they have about the justice system. Yeah, it goes back to what you're saying about perspective. Sometimes you got to be in certain situations to yeah. understand. Okay, now I understand it a little more. Um, but I, I got a few more questions I want to ask you. So, because so, you mentioned, um, like, you know, not not being watched like Law and Order and TV shows, mm -hmm. right? Did you watch the show Your Honor? Did you yes. watch that? So I watched parts of it, but anything that came out after I graduated law school, I usually didn't watch too much of it. Like I would watch Scandal, How to Get Away with Murder, which I love both of those. Both mm -hmm. of them are completely inaccurate as far as timelines oh, and all the other stuff. <laughs> um, Your Honor, I've heard some good reviews about, um, I actually was just about to start watching parts of it because a local attorney I know said that she, even though it wasn't accurate, she thought that the suspense that they ended gotcha, with every episode gotcha. was interesting. Okay. But from what I've heard from other attorneys, that show still isn't accurate timeline-wise. Just talking to you now, I, I'm, I realized that. And I watched it already, thank God. But uh, I was thinking, because you think about recusal and stuff, and, and I ain't going to say the show, but certain parts in the show, I was just like, even me, I got to come just as a degree, but I'm like, that, that, that just wouldn't happen. That's, yeah. not, that's not a real thing. Yeah. But I guess you have to entertain, so like, it, it's, it's easy to be like, well... We'll, we'll 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 forget this part. We won't say yeah. this because they, they don't let ask this question like exactly. that. Exactly. So. But it's I mean it's a good show. But I wondered that because I was going to ask you. But now you ain't watch. I let you watch it and enjoy. Yeah. It well, I've been told that it's not accurate, but I'm still going to watch it just because it's I heard it's cool, also though. entertaining. Pretty it has cool. a lot of cliffhangers. Pretty cool. Um. So I do want to ask you because I, I know you said some earlier about um at the the forum you was that before it was Huck. Mm -hmm. What was it going? Huck Law Group. Huck Law Group. So you were the only woman? Yes, yeah, so I was the only female attorney and the only minority attorney. Um, and it's Two for one. There we go. <laughs> Two for <Yes>. one. <laughs> but um, I'm still very close to the guys there. Um, Reed and Chase are some of my closest friends. Um, and I think that that was the good thing about working with the group is that, so for example, Sean Merzlach and I, we've tried several cases together and he's older than I am. He's obviously a white man. And I thought it was very helpful in our cases because we get to see two completely different mm. uh, perspectives when we're looking at a case. And so I think that sometimes having a case where, you know, your partner doesn't look like you or doesn't come from the same background as you helps you to appeal to a jury because right. there are some jurors that will think like Sean. There are some jurors who will think like Tiana. And so when we're looking at a case, we're going to argue back and forth about what facts we like, what facts we don't like. And it helps me to consider, you know, an opinion that I might not have on my own. Right. I, 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 well, I like that. That that's a good perspective because it's also good to tackle the case. Any anything that may come your way. Yeah. If you're thinking just like Tiana, you only thinking you know, Tiana. exactly. So to have the other perspective is great. It's great as well. Yeah. Um. So I was gonna ask, like, what is it like, uh, being in court and being a black woman inside those courtrooms, trying the cases you trying, uh, trying to over talk someone or. Yeah. Trying to, you know, not talk so much, you exactly. know, trying to hold your tongue. Like, what is that like being in a courtroom as a black woman? 
So I, I think that, you know, my whole life experience has kind of prepared me for that, right? Because, you know, we hear the term code switching, which is something that a lot of minorities deal with where, you know, I'm in a certain office, so I may not be able to talk as loud as I normally do around my family, or I may not use some of the cert- same slang that I would around my friends, or I may not play the same music in my office that I would listen to in my car. Um, and not necessarily at, you know, the former firm I was with, but just in school and jobs that you right, have in right, general, right. you like you talk about like your phone voice. Like if you've ever called your mom at work and got on a nerve sex, like, hey, can I have this snack? And she answers the phone. And you're like, who is this? Like, I don't even recognize you. You don't talk like this at home. Right. But that's just your mom assimilating because of the environment that she's in. Um, and so I think that that has been something I've dealt with my whole life. Um up until I went to pain, right? And that's why I love going to HBCU because it is a very unique experience to be around other minorities who have similar goals and you can just be yourself. Um, And I try to be myself to juries and I will tell a jury, um, you know, straight up like, hey, you know, I talk loud, I talk fast, I may speak improper English. Don't hold that against my client. That's just who I am. Mm. And I think that jurors will respect you for as opposed to trying to, you know, be stuffy and and speak in a different tone. Like I just talk in my regular voice because jurors are not idiots like they can tell when you're being something you're not and that will distract them from the position that you're trying to advocate for so it's best that you just be yourself but it is you know frustrating sometimes because people might think oh she's aggressive because she's a black woman or she's an angry black woman whereas if my white counterpart made the same argument they would think oh he's just a very you know thorough and aggressive um, and prepared attorney because he always has a response where if I always have a response then now it's just oh she's just argumentative Um, and so So those are things that I deal with, but I usually just, you know, take it with a grain of salt because I mean, I'm not getting paid to make everybody like me. I'm getting paid to do a job. (laughs) And so if that's something that you have a perception about me, that's, you know, that's a you problem. That's something that you were probably going to think no matter what about me. As soon as you saw me, if, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're judging me by my race or my gender or how I talk or how I walk, then, you know, you're somebody who I was never going to be able to, you know, convince anyway. And so that's not my job to focus on you. If, you know, you're just someone who's observing and you're thinking, oh, you know, Tiana talks too much or Tiana talks too fast or I would have never said it like, okay, are you the person who makes the final decision? If not, then, you know, thank you for your input. Maybe I will consider it and how I carry myself moving forward, but probably not. And so, um, you know, I think that I'm grateful to have that sort of confidence, but it's not something that came overnight. It's something that came from, you know, having mentors who believe in me or even, you know, just attorneys that I've worked with in the past or team leaders I've had who, you know, I try a case and when they give me feedback, they're not talking about how I talked or how I looked or how I did this. They're talking about my trial strategy. I've Mm -hmm. even, you know, gotten feedback from judges who will say, oh, you know, these were all the great things about you and the jury liked it. And so that does help you to become more confident when you're developing your style and just knowing that, you know, I can be myself and still get a good result. Um, And it's unfortunate that there are some attorneys who practice in areas where they can't be themselves. And, you know, I change certain things about myself for a trial. I might wear a dress where I normally might wear, you know, slacks. I like to wear Crocs when I'm running around town or running errands. But, you know, I can't wear Crocs to court. I have to wear wear heels or, you know, wear my hair a certain way or look a certain way. Um, You know, I don't really wear makeup. Sometimes I might have to, you know, dress it up a little bit more so that people will take me seriously because I am young and I do look pretty young. So sometimes, you know, I've been in areas where I go to a new circuit and I've had like a security guard say, Hey ma'am, you know, the defendant sit over here. And I'm looking at him like, <laughs> bro, I got on a blazer. I got on a dress. I got on heels. Everybody else in here for court is wearing jeans and a t-shirt. You knew I wasn't here for that. And I don't, I clearly wouldn't have walked up front to sit with the attorneys if I wasn't an attorney, but that was just him being nasty. Right. Yeah. And, you know, thankfully the, his supervisor actually saw it and it, it was the sheriff of the County who came over and apologized and was like, you know, this will never happen again. And I had one, one of the most serious cases on the calendar. And here it is, uh, you know, one of the officers is telling me, oh, you're not supposed to go up front. You're yeah. not an attorney. You didn't ask me for my credentials. You didn't know anything about me, but because it was your first time seeing me and I happened, maybe it was because I was black. Maybe it's because I'm a woman. Maybe it's because I look young, but nonetheless, without asking me any questions, you didn't even say, hey, ma'am, you know, are you an attorney? Do you have your bar card? You just immediately said you're going to the wrong place and this is where you're supposed to sit based on whatever, you know, preconceived yeah. notion you had about me. Yeah, and I wonder that, like, as a black woman, what, what's all the thoughts that go through your mind when you're doing this? So even you talking about it, saying it, like, you question whether it's because yeah. you're black, because you're a woman, because you're yeah. young, you know? We didn't even say the young piece, because I, 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 you young, you're younger than me, yeah. you're just talking now. So I'm thinking about that fact, that you are young. You yeah. Um, but the, I do want to ask you this, because I know I'm about to get out of here, but 
you uh you have so you started your your own firm. Yes. So can you talk a little bit a little bit about like what went into this, wanting to start your own firm, your own firm, and then just talk a little bit about your firm, what you offer. So okay. people can kind of get that. So um I will I started the bias firm in June of 2024. So this I haven't even hit my first month open for business and um, I'm just so thankful for all the support I've gotten. I literally did no advertising. I made a Facebook post and got a ton of shares. I, I, my phone is ringing daily. I've gotten new clients just about every day. Wow. Um, and so I specialize in criminal defense, but I also do family law. Um, and sometimes I'll handle juvenile issues depending on my availability and the timeline. But I try to tell people that even if it's not an area of law I practice in, you can still call me. And if I can't help you, I'm going to refer you to somebody who can or will try to give you the best advice possible to say, look, you know, this is what you need to do. This is who you need to mm -hmm. call. Because I'd rather you ask the questions, like I said earlier, than to just guess and put yourself in a bad position. Um, part of the reason I opened my own firm is because I do have two children. I'm very close to my family. Um, and I like to have flexibility over, you know, my schedule. And I like to have control over what type of cases I have because, you know, I'm grateful for anybody who ever, you know, reaches out to me to possibly represent them. And it's not a responsibility I take lightly. But I also don't take every single case because, one, I can't. I don't have right. the time for it. I'm I'm a human. And there's a certain level of, you know, responsiveness and a certain level of communication I like to maintain with my clients. So I don't take every case so that I can, you know, be available to answer the phone or send emails or give timely updates because I know that that's a big complaint that people have about attorneys is, you know, I paid them and then I don't hear from them again until it's time to go to court. And that's very frustrating. You don't want to pay an attorney and then they're walking in the courtroom looking around like, oh, Jane and they clearly don't right, know who right, you are. Right. They forgot what you look like. And so um, I just wanted to be able to provide a particular type of experience to people in Augusta, you know, based on my background, based on my personality, based on cultural views that I have. And so starting my own law firm allowed me to do that. That's dope. I'm proud of you for doing that as well. I always like to see people doing their own thing and kind of just bossing up, you know, even yeah. coming in here, I just, you could just feel like, and it wasn't like you was like, oh, I'm the person. It's like, just <laughs> your, your personality, like how you speak, you know, you even, you on the phone, like just how firm you are about, you know, what you're doing. I, I think it's amazing just seeing Thank that, you. like, seeing that from a distance, like not, I'm setting up, but I'm also listening. So I'm yeah. like, okay, I like, she, she, she on her stuff, she know her stuff. She's like, she's, <laughs> I like that, I like that a lot, man. Um, But I do, like, I wish, you know, your, your, your new firm, or your firm, rather, a lot of success. And um, I think that, uh, well, like, what is some way that people can not only just reach you, but like, like when you have cases, like, dude, are cases open to the public at all? Can the public sit in there like? Yes. Cause I be want to know. I, I would want to see you in action. Like yes. me personally now, just talking to you. Now I want to see you yes. in action. I don't know why I just do. Yeah, so um, you can always call my office at 706-535-3185. You can reach out to me on Facebook at Attorney Tiana Bias. Um, or you can visit my website, which is The Bias Firm. B-I-A-S is how you spell my last name, dot com. And you can send me a message there. Uh, criminal cases are usually public. So if you see someone get arrested or charged with a crime, you can always look them up um, in the clerk system, clcaugusta.com. Mm -hmm. And that'll let you know what kind of or upcoming court dates they have. But usually if someone wants to see me in trial, they'll see like an article come up on one of the publications to know that this trial is ongoing. Or sometimes they'll just stop in. I've had a number of people come see me in trial. I've had students from Augusta University come in and see uh, me in trial and I think people are usually surprised because I act very different when I'm in trial versus, you know, yeah. how casual I'll be, you know, in my office or if you stop me walking down the street or just in public because people do stop me and approach me. And I'm always glad when they do, because I do want to, you know, push the idea and the narrative that attorneys are regular people. We are just like yeah. you. We just happen to have a law degree. And that happens to be our job, because I think that people get this, you know, perception that they have to act a certain way or talk a certain way or walk a certain way when they're dealing with an attorney and you just need to be yourself and you need to be honest so that your attorney can help you um, and so that's really what I like to push for people to know that I want my clients to be comfortable talking to me yeah. and so um, you can always follow me on Facebook I try to do a, I'm working on doing a better job of keeping my social media updated. I have a personal page where I think I maxed out on friend requests almost. So I'm trying to go through those. Me too. Welcome <laughs> to the popular crew. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, you can always just reach out or you can call the office and say like, hey, does Tiana have a trial coming up? And they can always stop in. Or if I'm not in trial, I encourage people to just go look at other trials that are going on. I mean. Is it an age group? Uh, no. Like usually. the age, the age that just. I say I want to bring my daughter. Can I bring my yes. daughter to watch? Because I want, I want her to see things too. Yes. I want her to see and 
And she said she's going to be a lawyer, too. Yes. I, don't know, I don't know. She playing me now. now I'll I tell know. her, call me. I love when kids call me and we talk okay. about the okay. law. Or I've had students, you know, come in and uh, shadow me or intern with me so yeah, that they can see yeah. whether or not it's what they really want to do. Because uh, I never met a lawyer before I went to law school. Like, I didn't I didn't know lawyers. I didn't know anything about it. Only one I knew was Claire Huxtable. Really? Yeah. Oh, see, yeah. I used to see her on TV. I love Claire. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, my family knew Vic because Vic actually represented one of my cousins a long time gotcha. ago. So it was very full circle that I ended up working with him years down the road. Um, and he had a you know a great experience with my family. And my grandmother used to love him. So it was just crazy that I ended up working with him. But um, you can bring kids to court as long as they're going to be quiet. But you also have to make a decision as a parent what type of case you want them to sit on, definitely, right? Because definitely. a lot of the trials are going to be the more serious, violent, sexual cases because, that's, of course, that's something they can't reach an agreement heavy. on. So you just have to make sure you know what kind of facts there are for the case because you don't want to take your kid in, get their hopes up, and then, you know, they're bringing up autopsy photos and you're like, oh, you know what? Maybe, you know, yeah. eight-year-old Jayla doesn't need to see this or whatever. <laughs> right, so right. Um, those are just things that you need to think about. But even outside of court, I always encourage people, even if it's not me, reach out to another attorney. Uh, a lot of the attorneys in Augusta are very friendly they will talk to your kids they will let your kids come to court and see them uh, so that they can get firsthand exposure to the legal system outside of being a defendant or a party to a case well you know I, i'm interested in doing some more like black women definitely as well um so hopefully people seeing this i mean that's how it works people see it then they reach out to you so yeah um i'll see what i can do there because i definitely want to highlight uh like that aspect of it i mean white ones too i'm not yeah. saying i just you know I like to speak with people in law because everybody got different perspectives exactly. on how they approach it. I will say this. Y'all all talk y'all talk better than me. That's it. Y'all all talk fast. I can't get the words out, but y'all get them out. You be getting them out like that, like that, like that, like that. I like that, though. But yeah, I do it on a daily basis, so y'all have to do this. Yeah. The only last question I do got for you, I have to ask this question, is is it ever um like hard for you or... Do you stop when you have to say the word bias for real? Because yeah. it's your name. Because you kept saying, you said it when twice When I tell in you, I get that joke <laughs> so much. Um, and I feel like it's my karma because um, obviously uh, my maiden name is Williams. And so when uh, my ex-husband and I, who uh, obviously gave me the last name Bias, when I first met him, I made a joke about Bias. And he was like, okay, everybody says that. And I'm thinking, like, this is so <laughs> clever. And so I joked with him about it. I just was telling him the other day, I was like, you know what? I thought that was so clever. And now every day for the rest of my life, I get this joke about my last name being Bias, especially being an attorney. And yeah. everyone's talking about Bias. So I'm just like, that's just my karma. But for me, I, it's just as simple as saying my last name was Williams, which is, you know, what my maiden name was. And so I don't even think about it. I just know it's something that people think about. Like, I hear jurors when, like, we ask questions about Bias. I can see them, like, look at me like, oh, I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> she's thinking about you know her last name being biased and i'm like oh here we go but no it's funny i mean i still laugh at it because it's just it's just my karma i think for making that joke to bruce so many years ago no definitely definitely man uh, i definitely appreciate talking to you it was a great episode i loved it I, I'm, I'm ready to, you know, to edit it and put it out now i probably do with my daughter so she can watch it because i told her yeah I tell her to come see me she didn't get up in town so i said now you gotta stay home you ain't gonna but um, definitely, I know you said you got something to do at 12, so we got two minutes, so I did get you out in time. Hopefully, I'll have Thank you. <laughs> I was very pleased to uh, join it. Appreciate I think this you. is phenomenal. I hope that you will get more guests. If I can send you any guests, I will be happy to connect oh, you do. with people. Please um, do. Because I do think it's a very important area for people to see that there is more to Augusta than the Masters, right? I've never even been to the Masters, but Me that's either. what Augusta is known for, and there's so much more to our city than just the Masters tournament. Definitely, definitely. I appreciate you. Any guests you can send my way, please do. Um, I will. If you ever want to come back on just to talk about whatever, let me know. You know, we can get your own segment. I don't care. Um, start your own podcast. I help whatever you need to do. You know what I'm saying? I'm awesome. Help. So, um, Watermasters Podcast, we out, man. That was fun.